Hello, I'm Mark Klein. I'm a member of the Early American Coppers Club. This is an enhanced presentation on what my research on two new varieties that have been uncovered in the silly head varieties of 39. Okay, the most critical thing in the next deal is something that isn't a common term in anybody's dictionary, but it's the way that I have been able to see into these N4 family. And I call it die stage mapping. You begin by studying a die's aging path from the very earliest through the latest. And the key understanding here is, is that there should be a seamless transition of all the diagnostic points from the early to the end during its age progression. And when you come up with one and you say, well, this is different, it's not early, it's not middle, it's not late, then you wonder, well, is this just a variance? So then you start studying it, and all of a sudden you're able to build a complete dye aging map, dye stage, from early to late for another complete one with its own diagnostics. And I not only found one, but I found two. The next page. And what I have called it is I've called the two new obverse dyes, obverse 14 and 15. And after studying those obverses, I realized that there were also two new reverses, L and M, to the series. And then also doing die stage mapping, I reestablished Andrew's reverse D, which was part of the N9, which had been written off by Newcomb. So the varieties of Newcomb's reverse A are being rewritten. Since we're rewriting history, next, uh, we went back and Scott found a deal where in 1859, collectors only knew of four head types. They weren't called anything, but he kind of described them. But then when he illustrated them, next page, he illustrated only three, and they're done kind of with just a illustrated plate, kind of what you'd call an artistic rendition, as I don't think they had micro photography at the time. The next page, was a quote from John Wright's book on the scent book, and it's the origin of the term silly head and booby head have been traced in print to the 1860s and may have been common verbal use before that. And then, although minimally descriptive, these labels are just whimsical enough to suit the personality of the kind of soul that collects large scent varieties. So I, so they have persisted, and I wouldn't presume a change. And I really think that's, it's right on the money. Anyway, Scott, the next page, found in a Mason's Coin and Stamp Collector's Magazine, June 1868, the very first instance where they used the term silly head. Next page. And what he specifically mentioned were the head of 38, the silly head, and the silly head was also called the bowl head or the simple head. It depended on what side of the block you lived on to, to what you were going to call it. And then he called the other one the booby head and the head of 40. And the 1839 over 6 was not noted at all. The next page. Andrews is really the first one who started to really get into the naming of varieties. And it was published in 1883. Next page. And he listed only one through eight. And he did not recognize the number nine and nine as different as the N4. Evidently, he wasn't convinced they were separate dyes. But now we know they are. And because he only had one silly head, the reverse die for the silly heads were all called Andrew's reverse D. Melissa found an area from the numismatist. And it's kind of interesting because the author at that time said, eh, he blamed the design on large sense. 
at the feet of Congress and that they didn't have any acceptable patterns and that since 1809, nothing worthwhile came out. And he really singled out the booby heads and silly head sense as bad designs. Okay, next. In 1924, George Clapp expanded Andrew's original work. He added the A9, which was the N1, and he had a dash also A1. We don't know if both of those were 39 over 36 or if the N1 later became that. And then he added the number A10, which is the second obverse of A4, cracked, which was the N9. Then in 1940, Newcomb completed his work listing the original eight designs, varieties, and he added nine through 14 as we name them today. And the next thing is, is he said that Andrew's reverse D was only the same as his reverse A. He said it was just a wore down, heavily lapped design that got rid of some engraver marks that made it still the same reverse A. So as we see it, and we've gone into the books right now that are current, the 1839s are the N1, N4, and N9, all using reverse A. And there were only three varieties in this reverse A group. Here is an N9 that is very early. And because Newcomb had delisted Andrew's reverse D, it was just still reverse A. The next page. But the rewriting began when you look at the die stages. This die, as you see, is not struck from a heavily worn, lapped reverse die. With that sharpness of the detail of the wreath, the legend, and the denticles in the rim, that's not a die that's st struck already, struck some 800,000 coins. And I worked with John right on this, and we reestablished reverse D. And here's kind of a deal where you can see a reverse, a die stage mapping of the N9, where you have a, an early one on top, and you have a very late one on the bottom. And you can see in the late one, the lettering has become mushy, the denticles and rim have fallen away. It's definitely an old die to destruct those. And this is just a close up of just that rim area to show you an early D compared to a late D. Okay, the silly head working hub, all the silly heads share the same working hub. And it's indicated because it includes the portrait, the stars, and the ventilation. You cannot find any difference in the alignment between the star points and the denticles. All of the portraits have the same eyelashes on the upper eyelid. And that's the only large scent ever that had eyelashes. And I have a feeling she was silly and she would just bat her little eyes at you and say, silly you, trying to get that close to me. <laughs> okay, and then the stars are the same. Star 10, which is the one right behind the hair bun, the inner point has got kind of a blunt end and points down. So where would you look if there's anything different? You've got the same ventilation, the same star alignment, the same portrait. The only area is the date. And a silly head working HUD, number punches, I'm sure they had multiple number ones, multiple threes, eights, nines. And depending on which one they grabbed or when one wore out, they were replaced. So you could maybe look for alignment differences in the spacing and the tilt. The very first differences I saw, next page, I sent to John Wright early on in my research, and he gave him the nicknames. The N4 was a skinny date, and the N16 was what we called a fat date. It was boldly thicker in the lettering, and if you were to look at the gap here, this is very wide 
And this is kind of like a tight, compact fist. And I usually will use the threes a lot of time as my key to spot the differences. So using different die stages, this is kind of an overall die stage map of the N4. It's a early versus a late. And if you look at the center of the eight on top, the three with the slope of the tail of that, and of course the pointed angled part of the lead in of the curl, those three points are basically all the same. They'd show a consistent die aging, but they are the same diagnostics. The next one shows a early N16 to a late N16. And the fat date, if you look at the fatness of the eight in the small center circle and the tightness of the inner part of the three, and there was a die chip forming. And then there are the two dates close up. You can see they're pretty much the same diagnostics from an early to a late. Then the next one is an early and late 17. And I'm incorporating the three areas I look at it, which was the curl and the eight and the three. They have the same diagnostics continuing from early to late. And you can put any number of varieties or examples in between and still see the same diagnostics. What I did on the next one is, is I put together three early die states of just the date. And a lot of times you can almost see the differences in those dates from the different number punches. Now those coins that are used here will be shown by Scott. So you can see them in the copper and I've got enlarged photos so you can see exactly what I was looking at. From that early date, early die states, I changed and looked at the eights first, and I circled the inner negative space of the eight on the right. And you can see there's quite a bit of contraction and expansion in those eights. The N4, eight, has kind of a wider oval shape. The eight on the 16 is kind of a real tight, smaller eight with a thick wall around it. And on the N17, it's a little bit taller and wider. It's just a rounder version than what you see on the N4. When you get into the N3, the you can see when I highlight the negative space inside, that the four and the 16, the tail all has a sharp angle and it kind of curves up on the N17. This has kind of a, like a ski ramp where you come down and take right off. This one comes down, forms a big belly and then curves up. And once you're aware of those subtle little differences, they stand out. And again, you can see those from early through to late die stages. Okay, there's just the four, and you can see there's a wide gap in between the tip and the far side. I kind of call it like an, it's an elongated or a bozo nose kind of deal pushing it. And then when you get to the 16, it's got a very tight, almost like a fist inside, and it keeps that same tight fist all the way through. And on the 17, it comes around and has that upward curve to it. Uh, we say it's pointed upright, but not perfectly upright, but it comes a lot closer to the wall between here and here, and it's more centered than any of the other two. Another difference that we found was the development of a die chip on the N16. It happened on that little tuck around point and it came up with what we call a squared lead in where it comes down and hits kind of like that break die crack or die chip and stops. 
and it becomes more and more pronounced the later the dye becomes. Next one is that attribution key of the dye chip is easily seen from early, middle, to late. You can follow the development of that chip. And then even on worn examples, you can tell the N16, the effect of that dye chip, because even on the 4 and the 17, that curves around is still pointed, where you kind of come and it stops on the 16. And there's again the squared lead in versus a pointed on the 4 and the then 17. Doing die stages after I had picked out and had a run of early to late for all three varieties, I flipped over the reverse. And the main thing that I caught was there's a continuous die aging from early to late die stages in a variety. And each brand new obverse had a brand new reverse. And when you had a very late die state obverse, you had a very late die stage reverse. And then when I looked at the uh, N16, you have the same way where the original one, it's a continuous aging transition, but the obverse starts out brand new on the obverse and brand new on the reverse and brand new and it's very terminal on the obverse and reverse. So it has its own complete uh, aging path. Then on the N17, it also starts with a brand new obverse and a brand new reverse. And it ends with a very late obverse and a very late reverse. And like I say, I tell the difference in aging the early ones have got all the dentalation, sharp legend, and the dentalation almost disappears, and it's very mushy on the legend. So kind of breaking down Newcomb's reverse A, there are what we call engraver marks on the A, the L, and the M, and the N9 did not have them. And those are located in the outer leaves underneath the T of states and over to the E under the leaf above it. Next was the one thing that I did find that was different on the reverse with the N17 is it developed, there was a clashing of the dies and you can see an impression of the earlobe between the ends of one and the end of scent. Now this is the part with this die stage a, you may, aging maps, is all of a sudden you say, well, all the obverses of the 4, 16, and 17 have got two little hub flaws that show. They were positioned here and here, and sometimes they're called the 3 dash 9 dash dashes. And people for years thought, ah, that's one obverse die because only one obverse die would have matching dashes, but they were transferred from a hub to three working dies. Because what it is, is here's a picture of the obverse four, the 14 and 15. All of them have the dashes, but when you look at the diagnostics of the eight and the three, you can prove that they're different. So that means they were all transferred from the same working hub, not a symbol of a one working die. The next one is, that's just a key where you can see the difference in uh, the structure of the eights, threes, and then also the fact that the 14 has that little die chip that kind of started. Now on the reversed hub, this was also considered to be signs of one hub, and that is there were these engraver marks, what they were called, located under the T of states and between the E and the underleaf on the inside. And 
What I did was reverse A and reverse L and reverse M all have those engraver marks. So at first, that's why they haven't been seen as different. It was, ah, same marks, same die. But you can take the reverse A, starting with an N4, you can follow it all the way to a late die state on the N4. Then when you have an reverse L, you start with a full dentilation, uh, dentilation, sharp letters, to the point where the letters become mushy and the real is gone. And you can do the same thing with M. It starts early and ends late. And you can see this, but you have to do the diagnostics by looking at the obverse. Because it was almost a full hub with almost no differences, just like the same variety of coins, but because you can do the die staging based on what you see on the obverse, you know that there has to be three different reverses. And the big challenge that I had here was how to separate and identify different dies when Goldbrick's hubbing experiment created so almost identical dies. There are no easily seen diagnostic differences that people have relied on for years, such as die cracks, cuds, missing berries, broken wreaths. It just doesn't work. The only real key that you have is die stage mapping. And you can prove that every early silly head obverse is paired with a reverse. And they have a complete independent aging path from early to late. Then if you look, and uh, neither die wear nor striking variances have combined to merge any of these paths together. You just can't insert one anywhere into either one of the other two. So that's kind of the proof that I built for the fact that there are the, three new, or the two new varieties. This is how I have rewritten the 39s that were at one time just considered reverse A. Reverse A goes for the N1 and the N4. Obverse 14 mated with reverse L for the N16. Obverse 15 mated with reverse M to make the N17. And N9 was a combination of obverse 9 with reverse D. 